It's a super Tuscan red wine from Italy. So it's a combination of Cabernet Sauvignon and Sangiovese. And it's a bottle of Italian wine that's like the opus one of, of Italian wine. Right. So it sells for it sells for like three hundred dollars a bottle, and then on wine lists, it's like the most coveted Italian wine. Oh, gnarly! Yeah, pretty legit. A little fourteen-year-old, thanks to you. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, I can't wait until we. I can't wait until we get through this and we can actually drink whiskey again together. Oh, it's gonna be nice. This is my first whiskey in all week. Yeah, I had a I had a beer last night because I hadn't done anything or I hadn't drank in three weeks, but I worked really hard in setting up my my additional shelves and getting everything all put together. So uh, I felt like I needed to celebrate with a little something. Ease my way into it. Perfect. Well, yeah, I mean, I, the first two weeks I got wasted, like pretty much every day. I would like it was it, once it was once it was like one o'clock. I was like, why not have have a few whiskeys? And by the time I got to dinner, I was like, whoop, doo -doo, doo -doo. Uh, <laughs> so then. Last week, I was like, all right, I'm going to calm it down. And so this is like the first whiskey I've had in, yeah, seven days. And, and my buddy. His name's Patricio. Patricio. Yeah, he just... Uh, yeah, he just had a, his baby last week, and uh, he's been pretty much playing fatherhood uh, and hasn't slept much, but now he's finally starting to get a little bit of rest and sleep. So I got to I got to close my windows because every night at 8 p.m., everybody in Ocean Beach howls like dogs. Ow! Like every night at 8 p.m. Everybody, like everybody, the whole neighborhood, all the way from my house to Holly's house, everybody I know in OV is like, I was like, hey, are people, do people howl at 8 p.m.? And he was like, yeah, what's that all about? And I think it ended up on one of like the OV Facebook pages. And it was like, hey, every night at 8 p.m., like everybody howl. So like literally like every, you can just hear it like all up and down, all up the hill. Like, so I got to make sure I shut my windows because last week one of them was open and all of a sudden it started like right when we started and I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> So instead of clapping for all the uh, health workers and, and people working in the hospitals, San Diego howls at APN. Yeah, right. Perfect. What's that? It's really nice. It's a, uh, it's fruity. It's got some spice. It's got a little bit of earth and tannins. Uh, forty six. So all the all the private editions are forty six, uh, ABV except for the uh, Alta, which is the tenth anniversary, and that one's fifty one point two. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that's made from uh, the wild yeast. So pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So the the Artane was released in two thousand and twelve. So it's, it's an oldie. Yeah. Yeah, it's an oldie. Ooh, that's nice. Uh, the nineteen. Yeah, hundred percent. The uh, amazing. The supernova is really nice, but the uh, the nineteen is is magnificent. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Nice. When all this settles down, if you guys ever make it up to Orange County, this whole shelf is all Ardbeg. Ooh, the lolly. I just got this guy. Yeah. Oh, shit. How much whiskey is in there? What's that? Uh, it's unopened. Oh my goodness gracious. So I have all four of them now. I just completed the set. Oof. But yeah, uh, that whole shelf is all Ardbeg. So help, help me drink it. <gasps> oh my God. See, babe, I'm not that bad. She's always telling me how bad I am. I'm like, this looks like a little baby dick compared to that. Yeah. Baby dick. <laughs> so, look, at, look at it in here. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. On and on and on. Oh. How now, brown cow? Watch out. The human bank was, the human torch was denied a bank loan. Ow now, brown cow. So, uh, light, lighting on my end is good and everything? Yep, you look great. Well, that's my closet, and it's completely full of random crap right now. So, block I, it. Yeah, I put the surfboard there to block it, is what I did. I live in a one bedroom apartment that's 500 square feet, and this is half of my house. <laughs> yep. Forecasts. Mm, So it's just me and her. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Why don't you just put them on us so they can see us? Because I'm smiling. Chad likes to have control. Oh, you, you can tell. <laughs> awesome. What are those uh, Celtic cross bottles up there? Uh, so that's uh, Ardbeg Kill Dalton. Oh, very nice. Um, only available at the distillery. Uh, back. Uh, the ABC bottles? Uh, so those are the ones that we released for the Tastemakers series, which were um, basically back in 2010, around that time period, we sent out bottles to bloggers and, and whiskey writers kind of before Instagram and all that. And we asked them to vote for their favorite whiskey. Uh, so we sent them samples of A, B, and C, and we didn't tell anybody what they were. So um, we just asked them to taste them, give their tasting notes, and then essentially choose their favorite. So um, 
unanimous, unanimously uh, C1, and that was the Manthania Sherry finish, which went on to become uh, a whiskey called Tagtha, which is this one. this one here. Oh, yep, I've had that before. Yeah, I think you guys have one in the bar, actually. Yeah, we have a few, I think. So, um, so yeah, A and B are essentially the rejects, and they were never released to anybody. Um, and then they found a couple cases of them in New Jersey in our warehouse. So I asked if I could have a couple uh, bottles so I could use them for events and seminars. And, uh, yeah, we've used them a few times in San Diego. Oh, nice. Um, a is a Grand Cru uh, Burgundy finish, and B is a Grand Cru Bordeaux finish, and then C was the Manthania Sherry finish. Um, but yeah, pretty awesome whiskeys for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Well. Yep. Welcome to another episode of Whiskey Society. I'm your host, Josh Judd. Tonight we'll be talking about whiskey. My host this evening is my good friend and one of the most whiskey obsessed people I've ever met, Travis Tidwell. Travis has been in the whiskey industry for over 10 years and has worked with some truly amazing brands throughout his career. Travis and I will be talking about Glen, the Glen Morangy Distillery this evening and how it has continued to blow the minds of whiskey drinkers around the world. I would like to thank everybody for tuning in this evening, and hopefully you were able to find a bottle of Glen Morangy and are looking forward to another weekend at home. If you're having a good time and enjoying the show, uh, leave us a tip at the GoFundMe page. Our link is below. Um, Travis, how are you doing? It's good to see you, man. It's been a while. Doing well. Thank you. It's good to see you as well. Uh, just kind of settling in and trying to keep myself pretty busy and occupied uh, with all this you know, craziness going on in the world right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, um, let's let's talk about how you're doing during this quarantine because I know that you have a pretty busy lifestyle uh, before this all happened, and now that you're locked down, uh, how are you coping with this? I'm coping pretty well. It's been a good time to get some relaxation and uh, just rest up. You know, going from having 90 flights last year to essentially being grounded for eight weeks so far uh, has been a pretty interesting transition. But I took some time to reorganize, uh, start cataloging my collection, um, just playing some video games, and uh, trying to stay overall healthy during this. Um, so yeah, I haven't, haven't been doing a whole lot of uh, too much, uh, but spending some time uh, with the wife, the cat, and uh, playing some video games. Awesome, awesome. Have you picked up any embarrassing habits? Like, for example, for me, I've learned that I can binge eat homemade cookies every single night of the week, uh, which is starting to set in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of my kind of guilty habits is uh, staying up too late, uh, playing video games, ironically. Uh, I get sucked in and just kind of forget about time. And next thing I know, it's one, two, three in the morning. And then uh, <laughs> I realize it's time to go to bed. Oh, I'm pretty sure we all know that. Um, all right, well, let's talk more about some whiskey. Um, what was the first whiskey you ever tried? Yeah, um, so one of the very first whiskeys that really got me into whiskey uh, was surprisingly uh, Highland Park 12-year-old, um, which to me is kind of this quintessential, you know, it has a little bit of everything for everyone, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of smokiness, a little bit of floral characteristics. Um, and I tried that back in, uh, God, when I was 21, 22 years old, I was working behind a bar as a bar back and, uh, I had a great bar manager who would let me taste one thing on the back bar every night when we closed. And, you know, I saw this random bottle on the back bar that looked intriguing to me. It was the oval bottle of Highland Park with the orange label. And, uh, I opened it up and I, I poured myself a little bit just so I could learn more and, and taste it and see what it was all about. And I tasted it and I, immediately I was like, I've never had anything like this in my life. And it just completely blew me away. I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't love it when I first had it because it was such a unique and different expression. But it's one of those whiskeys that I continually go, go back to because it continually grows, grows on me. It's also one of those whiskeys that I feel evolves. It's got so much complexity and depth to it that it really just 
you know, kind of, you always keep going back to it, I guess. There's always something. I, I, I 100% agree. I love, I love some high 12 year. That's one of my favorites. Um, now, I can't really remember the first whiskey I ever tried, um, but I can remember the first whiskey I tried that really changed my whole attitude towards whiskey. Um, that was Booker's. And I just remember taking a sip and it felt like a pine forest was on fire, like going down in my esophagus. Um, and I've been hooked ever since that day. Um, do you remember the first whiskey that really knocked your socks off? That kind of made you say like, hey, this is what I want to do. Yes, uh, it was uh, our big 10 year old actually. Um, I was on a snowboarding trip in Park City, Utah. And I just uh, bought this bottle at the state liquor store on a whim. And I'd never tried it before. And we, me and a couple of my buddies, we were snowboarding. We put that in our flasks and we were sipping on that throughout the course of the day while we were snowboarding. And to me, just taking a sip of that Ardbeg 10 year old on the ski lift in the perfect, uh, you know, really cold climate, you got the really, really fresh air, you smell the pine trees, and then you take a sip of that sweet, salty, caramel, kind of campfire in a glass Ardbeg 10 year old. And, and to me, that was the light bulb whiskey. Um, and that was, you know, eight years ago. Um, 10 years ago god it's been it's been a long time but yeah it just blew my mind and from that day forward i've always been a huge art big fan um i've always liked glenmorangie as well which is the sister distillery to art bag um and i really have fallen in love with glenmorangie now um because of the association and, and being able to taste all these whiskeys the art bag was the one that really pulled me in yeah i got the hook line and sinker yeah so art bag is a delicious whiskey well, you mentioned earlier that um, you were a bar back once upon a time. Uh, can you tell us about your first industry job, if that was it, and kind of the journey uh, throughout the industry that got you to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my first bar backing job was in Huntington Beach, and it was for a uh, rock star, actually. So he owned a restaurant. It was the drummer of Corn, so the rock band Corn, oh. and uh, pretty crazy time. Um, really interesting guy to work for, but you know, it really was a great experience because it was a high paced bar, really fast, really busy. I was in culinary school at the time. So while I was going to school, I was working in the, or I was working in the kitchens as well as a bar back at the same restaurant while going to school. And I re quickly realized that I didn't want to cook professionally for a living, but I did fall in love with, you know, entertaining guests and being you know, personable at the bar and, and really learning about all these different categories of spirits. I saw the each bottle as a different flavor or a different ingredient, um, kind of like what I was learning in culinary school. So I took that and started making cocktails, utilizing my, my, my culinary school background. And it really kind of helped me develop and create my own style back then, which helped me progress in this industry as a whole, I would say. Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. Um, let's talk about Glenn Morangy, shall we? Yeah, uh, let's. <laughs> would you mind giving us a, a brief history of Glenn Morangy and maybe some cool and interesting facts about the distillery that we might not know? Sure, yeah. So Glenn Morangy is um, it's this really kind of interesting distillery that was built up in the northern part of Scotland, not necessarily in the most um, remote or not necessarily in the most convenient place. Um, surprisingly, it's about five hours north of Glasgow or Edinburgh by car. Um, it's situated in a little kind of village called Tain, and it's a, it's a population of about 300 people now, but it was originally built in this location because of a water source. Um, and it was built actually as a brewery to start. And the, the reason for that is the unique location and the unique site uh, of the water is, is quite unique to Scotland. It's what we call a hard water source. Um, which is very uncommon in Scotland. So when you're typically making high-end beers or ales, you want this mineral-rich water source, this hard water source, which really isn't found in Scotland. There's only a handful of distilleries that have this mineral-rich water source, Glenmorangie being one of them. And I believe that that's why the distillery was built in this location back in 1843. Um, and it was founded as the Glenmorangie Brewery back then. So it's located in Tain. And it's situated on what we call the Dornick Firth, which is a big body of water that separates the west side of the highlands from the east side of the highlands. Um, so it's quite a unique location as well. 
Sounds beautiful. Yeah, really, really quite nice. So, yeah, kind of fun. Well, I know you mentioned the water source just now, and I know distilleries uh, are always talking about the water source. And so could you go a little bit further into that and kind of like, do you have a natural spring, I'm assuming, based off the mineral richness that you were talking about? or Yes. So um, the Tarlubi Springs is about three miles north of our distillery up in the uh, foothills of the highlands. And basically, there's all these little springs that are bubbling up naturally underneath the ground. And they come up into an, uh, a spring-fed uh, well, which we call the Tarlogi Springs. Um, when it's doing that, it's being filtered underground through an aquifer. And it's being kind of uh, filtered through this limestone, calcium, and magnesium. So it goes, it, it basically translates the rainwater underground. It bubbles up about 10 to 15 years, roughly. And then it comes up uh, and it's ready to drink water uh, that has a very high mineral content, which is um, kind of the, that unique aspect that most of the distilleries in Scotland don't have. There are a few distilleries that have a hard water source, but it's not a spring fed. It's not being filtered underground. It's more hard water through the rivers and, and streams where ours is actually going underground through that aquifer and then bubbling up naturally. Um, into the Tarlogi Springs, the natural source. And then you can go and actually drink the water straight away, um, which have I've had, done. Have you had a chance to do that? Yeah, I have done it. I was a little scared at first, you know, you see this algae floating in the water, you <laughs> see the water bubbling up in the ground and they're like, no, it's totally safe. Go ahead and give it a taste. And the water actually drinks almost like a uncarbonated badois, if you're familiar with that water. It's a very chalky water, um, but it gives us, a lot of uh, additional kind of food source, if you will, during the fermentation process. And it gives us a much more active and rapid fermentation, which is one of the unique aspects of Glenmorangie is the water because of that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So Glenmorangie has this amazing, like light, just really, really easy, like mouthfeel. And then the, like, the underlying characteristic of Glenmorangie, every Glenmorangie I've had is this like really, subtle and delicate base with a lot of flavor on top. Um, could you go a little bit more into like what creates this? Uh, and I know we were just talking about fermentation and how the mineral rich spring water gives it a little bit of a bump during the fermentation process. Could you kind of yeah. walk through what's happening and why you end up with such a light, uh, easy spirit to drink? Yeah. So I, I think that's one part of what makes Glenmorangie light, delicate and fruity. Uh, but, Throughout the whole production process, we have these little tiny things, uh, these small factors that are happening throughout the production process. And each step creates an extra layer of that complexity to it. So having the water source, having the fermentation, having the stills, having the active copper contact of the stills, the shape and size of the stills, all, that little, all those little things uh, adding up on top of each other makes Glenmorangie what it is. So it's, I'd say it's a combination of all these little tiny things or little factors that then become a large factor that create that light, delicate fruitiness of Glenmorangie. So the water source is definitely one of them. The very active, rapid fermentation is another. Um, and then one of the major things for us is the shape and size of the stills at Glenmorangie. Glenmorangie has the tallest stills in all of Scotland. They're 16 feet, nine inches, um, and they're very, very tall and slender. We actually bought those stills back in 1897 from a gin producer in London, and we imported those into Scotland, and we started making single malt whiskey with those. And what that does is it gives us a lot of copper contact because of the shape and size, how tall they are. As the vapors are distilling up, they're interacting with the copper and the walls of the still, and that is called reflux. So the more amount of copper contact, the more reflux there is. And that contributes to more of the lighter, delicate, and fruity characteristics that translate, in, uh, translate over into the finished kind of distillate, if you will. So if you look at it from the opposite end, if you have a, a short, squatty still, you're going to have less copper contact. You're going to have less reflux your distillation time is probably going to be shorter, which means you're going to have a, a thicker, oilier, and meatier type of whiskey. Um, whereas Glenmorangie has a very long fermentation, or sorry, long distillation, 
you get a lot more copper contact. So that translates into more of those citrus fruits, kind of that perfumed, light, delicate fruitiness that you taste in Gwent Orangey. I'm getting it right here. Yeah. Absolutely delicious. For everybody out there, I am currently drinking some Quinta Ruban 14-year-old aged in pork casks. It is absolutely delicious. I hope you guys are enjoying your Glen Morangies out there as well. Uh, Travis, I have a few pictures from the distillery. Uh, would you mind kind of walking us through these and kind of telling us what we're looking at? Absolutely. So the first picture that we see here is uh, a couple of our warehouses, which are actually facing the Dornick Firth. Those uh, warehouses face, face the face the ocean, and that allows uh, a little bit of a more temperate climate, a little bit more of a uh, kind of oxidative uh, maturation where we get more uh, kind of that circulation from the breeze in the ocean, which allows for um, some of our more experimental whiskeys is what we put in these warehouses because they are closer to the ocean. Some of the uh, warehouses that are a little bit further in on the mainland, uh, a little bit further in from the ocean, rather, are going to be more of our staples. That's where we typically put Glenmorangie 10 year old uh, and most of our bourbon casts that will be laid down for the poor rain. So, some of the private edition whiskeys and things like that are going to be closer towards the uh, warehouses on the ocean, which is kind of cool. So, that's Very what we're cool. looking at here. That's a, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. So, this is the water source. This is the Tarlogi Springs. This is that. Uh, pic this is the picture of the of the of the water that naturally bubbles up out of the ground from the aquifer. It's that mineral rich water source. So as you can see, it's quite a beautiful location, beautiful place. And this is where we uh, the water is then uh, piped down to the distillery, but it's all gravity fed. Um, so it's a uh, we're not pumping it or anything like that. It's being gravity fed to the distillery. Um, so it's kind of cool for, for that aspect. Another kind of tidbit for Glenmorangie, uh, we just went 100% natural gas uh, last year. So Glenmorangie is 100% green as a distillery. So kind of oh, a cool thing. Cool. Yeah, we just did that last year. So Very cool, very cool. Yep. And then uh, this is some of the archived pictures we found, or blueprints rather, of the stills um, when we purchased them back in 1897 and actually put them into the distillery. Um, so it kind of, if you can really look in at that picture, it shows the shape and size of the stills, the height, the dimension, and kind of what's going on in there. Those stills are actually very uncommon in the Scotch whiskey industry. If you've seen pictures of other stills, you'll recognize that usually they're a lot fatter on the bottom, and sometimes they taper up like a china cap or like a onion still. Um, it is another kind of common style. Well, these are pretty uncommon, pretty unique. They look beautiful. They do indeed. And here they are. Uh, so this is what we call the cathedral. So currently at Glen Morangie, we have 12 stills. Um, they're paired up six and six. So we have six wash stills and six spirit stills. And this just kind of shows the scope and size of the stills. Um, it's really such a beautiful picture. Uh, another random fact, if you Google still house or stills, Glen Morangy is usually on the first page, and it, it's usually the first uh, picture of the still uh, on, on Google, which is kind of cool. <laughs> That's awesome. It is yeah. beautiful. Now, are yeah. there, like, is there a, a rhyme or reason? Are there, like, spirit stills and wash stills on one side? Or are they kind of matched up? Or Yeah, so all the spirit stills are on one side, and all the wash stills are on the opposite side. Okay. And that's just to keep uniform. It's to keep everything consistent. Um, yeah. Awesome. And we have some few more pictures of stills here. Yep, showing them in all their glory, 100% copper. Beautiful, a little close-up picture for everybody. Yep. And wood. What's yes. up here, Travis? So wood, we, we take a unique approach to our maturation. Um, the Morangy has been utilizing bourbon casks since the early 60s. Um, we were one of the one of the main distilleries back in the 1960s to really start utilizing bourbon casks. We think it marries perfectly with our spirit character. Uh, it allows our light, delicate fruitiness to kind of marry together with those white oak uh, bourbon casks. So we basically partnered up with a company called Brown Foreman uh, back in the 1960s. And uh, we started utilizing and building our own casks 
out of the Ozark Mountains in Missouri in the 1980s. But we really started uh, exploring and looking at these uh, white oak uh, species of trees and, and utilizing that. So what we do uh, is we use about nine, 80 to 90 percent of uh, the barrels we use are actually bourbon casks. And that's quite uncommon. However, I would say in this day and age, it's becoming more and more common with the lack of um, and also just other distilleries realizing the potential and the spirit character. It really highlights your distillery DNA and it showcases a distillate that you're actually producing. Whereas sometimes when you can put your whiskey into like a big sherry cask or a big red wine cask, it can take over and dominate the flavors in, in your actual your distillate. So that makes total sense. Some some uh, staves that are being air dried out in um, Kentucky or Tennessee. And uh, it's a different approach that we take because we believe it makes a difference in the whiskey. So half of the barrels we use are what we call our designer casks, where we air season the wood for 36 months in the open air. And then we'll do a heavily toast and lightly char on them. So a little bit different approach to making those barrels that we call our designer casks. Awesome. And here, this is uh, a beautiful stone. Rock. This is a beautiful stone. Um, this is a recreation of what is known as the Hilton of Cadball. So the Hilton of Cadball is, um, the Hilton of Cadball is uh, essentially a unique stone that was found off the, the, the coast of the Dornick Firth. And it's located on our property called the Glenmorangie House. So what, what we did is um, about 25 years ago, we, we started excavating this site and we found these large chunks of granite that were coming up out of the ground. And that sparked us to do a full on excavation of the site. And we found engravings on the stone. And the engravings date back to the eighth century uh, AD and they were carved by the Pictish tribe. So we basically commissioned a, a traditional stonemason and a historian really to, to, to go through these pieces that we found and recreate the stone. His name's Barry Grove. And what you see on, on that image is actually the recreation of the stone. So the original stone is located in the Museum of Modern History in Edinburgh. Um, and this is the recreation. But on the bottom portion of the stone, you'll notice something called the signet. And that's what we use um, on our Glenmorangie distillery as kind of our, our distillery icon or our distillery emblem, if you will. And that's because of that signet that we found on the bottom of the stone. And it's also why we created that whiskey called Glenmorangie Signet. Well, that is a perfect segue into what I, my biggest question of the night, which is my favorite whiskey is the Glenmorangie Signets. And you can yes. kind of see the lovely little signet. Signet. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about this whiskey and why it tastes so absolutely amazing? Yes. So this whiskey was created by our whiskey creator. Uh, his name is Dr. Bill Lumsden. He has his PhD in biochemistry. Um, his thesis was on yeast. Um, so he likes to run and do a lot of different experiments. And that's why we created something called the private edition range. Um, the last private edition we just created was called the 10, uh, was the 10th anniversary of the private edition range. We called we created a whiskey called Alta, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But Signet is a really quite a unique whiskey here because we took the traditional method of making whiskey but we wanted to innovate and create something different if we could. So what we did is we took a uh, heavily roasted chocolate malt or we took our standard barley and we heavily roasted it in essentially a, a commercial sized coffee roaster. And what that did is it created these rich, roasty, toasty, coffee, espresso-like characteristics in the whiskey. Normally that would not be something you can do um, you know, because we are so heavily regulated by the Scotch Whiskey Association that we can only, um, you know, use different types of casks. We have to be very careful with what we can do to innovate or create a new product. This was one of the whiskeys we kind of got in trouble for. But Dr. Bill actually was able to prove that back in the original days when the uh, farmers were also the distillers and they were making their whiskey, 
and they accidentally maybe overcooked or burnt their barley, they wouldn't have thrown it out. They would have used it. So it would have been a traditional kind of, of method of making whiskey. So that was kind of the gray area and how we were able to create this whiskey. So that's just one of the components in the actual Glenmorangie Signet. Some of the other components are whiskeys that are aged in bourbon casks um, that have been finished for five years in new American white oak. So having that five-year finish in virgin oak gives it a big, bold spice, a rich toastiness, and a lots of vanilla. We also use some really, really old sherry casks in that whiskey, and that gives it a lot of richness and depth and kind of that syrupy characteristic. And then there's some secret other whiskeys in there that Dr. Bill Lumsden won't share. It keeps it very closely guarded um, because, you know, it is quite a unique whiskey and you haven't really seen too many other distilleries out there creating something like it. Um, I will say there is a distillery in Seattle called Westland and they make a whiskey that uses some heavily roasted chocolate malt in their production. And that some of their whiskeys have kind of those uh, chocolatey espresso notes in, in their, their whiskey, but it doesn't have the age and the length of time in cask like the Glen Orange Um So yeah, quite a unique one. I never thought that this whiskey tastes better, but it actually does right now. Thank you yeah. for that. This is some absolutely amazing whiskey. Um, yeah. you, you, you mentioned earlier about a limited edition line that comes out once a year. Um, yep. When do these come out? And... Have you made anything like it's been going on for how long? Uh, so 10 years. Last year was the 10th anniversary. Um, so we've been doing these experiments for 10 years. Um, Dr. Bill wanted to kind of end it with the 10 year old. So we are not creating any more of the private editions. Mm. However, we're moving on to more creative aspects of Glenmorangie. So Dr. Bill's still innovating and creating these new, exceptional, fun tasting whiskeys, utilizing different production techniques cast types and things like that but you know it all started with a whiskey called one orangey sonalta px which was created back in 2009 and that was finished for two years in px sherry i'm drinking a private edition number uh three um which is called artane which was uh bottled back in 2012 which is a sasakaya finish uh, and then the most recent one was the the alta which was a whiskey that was created from wild yeast. So on the Cadball estate, we own 200 acres of land and we grow barley there. So Dr. Bill found um, wild yeast strains that were living on the husks of the barley on the Cadball estate. He captured that, grew it up, created a bunch of different species of wild yeast. And then we were able to make a full production of a whiskey with that wild yeast. And that was called Alta. In Scots Gaelic, Alta means wild, and it's because it was made from a wild yeast strain. Um, I actually happen to have one handy, so it's uh, this this bottle here. If you can, if you can see it there, so Beautiful. Alta bottled at fifty one point two, uh, and it's it, it's aged exclusively in uh, North American white oak, and it's a combination of second fill. Uh, mostly second fill bourbon barrels because we want the spirit character to actually be highlighted as opposed to using heavier influencing oak which would take over and dominate the flavor of the whiskey so we wanted to use kind of this a uh, little bit more used oak because it gives it brings out more of the uh, wild yeast characteristics awesome so it's, kind of, it's kind of funky it's got some interesting sour kind of funky off um very very ripe fruits and characteristics to it but it is a fun one next time i go to the bar i'm gonna go give that a little try it's been a while since i've had it my favorite um glen Morgie limited edition that came out was the millison um i just remember it had this like epic candy cane looking bottle and it had this this pepperminty quality um yep could you tell me what's going on with the Millison? Because I completely forgot. What was that? That must have been four years ago when it came out? or Yeah. So that was, I think, 2015 or 2000. Yeah, 2015. And what that is, actually, that was another one of Dr. Bill's crazy experiments where he wanted to see what would happen if we took um, basically Glenmorangie original and threw it into a barrel that had been heavily charred after the wine 
had been dumped immediately. So we took these red wine barrels from Portugal and as soon as the wine was dumped out, Dr. Bill had the barrels heavily charred inside. And what it did is it crystallized all these little wine sugars and it created these crystallized kind of characteristics inside of the cask. We then filled Glamorangie into it and it created all these can excuse me, candied sweet characteristics. And that's actually what Milchen means. It means sweet things in Gaelic. And that's why the box looks like a candy store or a sweetie shop. It's because Dr. Bill wanted to create a whiskey that was reminiscent of his childhood. He worked with another great professor named Dr. Jim Swan to figure out how you can target these candied sweet characteristics. And then he reverse engineered and made the whiskey that way as opposed to sticking whiskey into a barrel, letting it age for five years and seeing what happened. He kind of took it from a different approach to, to target the flavors he wanted and then how you would achieve those flavors um, that way. So that was kind of a fun experiment. Um, that was a very polarizing whiskey. A lot of people either really loved it or really hated it. I, yeah, I, I like it a lot as well um, because it was really quite sweet, but also the packaging. Uh, the packaging was really, Quite interesting. I'll show you it because I happen to have it handy. So, so, so this is a uh, this is Milchen. So as you can see, uh, quite an interesting package and label. And then um, there's the whiskey itself. I just remember that whiskey like complete like when I. I've tasted a lot of red oranges and I, I'm always excited about the limited editions when they come out. It's always a new, exciting, like, all right, what do they do this time? And I remember like getting the box and being like, this looks ridiculous. And then opening it out and being like, that bottle looks ridiculous. And then pouring it and being like, this tastes exactly what that box looks like. And for me, that just like blew me away. Cause I was like, well, what does that taste? And then it took me down this road that made me, I couldn't, I couldn't disagree with it. Even though at first I didn't like the flavor profile, the, the ability to create something that I've never tasted before in scotch was really impressive, and I really enjoyed that. So, Yeah, it was quite, quite, a, <laughs> yeah, it was quite a groundbreaking one. Um, you know, when I first saw it, I, I wasn't a huge fan of the packaging, and they kind of sent out the packaging and imaging to the entire company, and everybody – turned it down and, and, and kind of gave, gave negative feedback on it. But two people liked it, and it was Dr. Bill and the CEO of Glenmorangie. So guess what? Here it is. Approved. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Awesome. That's, kind, like of a, that's kind of a fun internal story that, that most people don't know. So that's kind of a fun one. Yeah. That's awesome. I really like that. Um, so we talked about Dr. Bill. Um, we talked about – Pretty much all the questions I had. Um, I guess we'll leave it up to you guys, guests out there. If you have any questions for me or Travis, uh, send them in our comments link below, um, and we will answer them. Travis, uh, if you could just grab one of those Nika bottles from behind yep. you, the, perhaps the yellow one. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah, absolutely. Next to the Hacker Shoes. Yeah, there you go. What is that? So this is a, a whiskey called Woody and Vanolic. And it's a Yuichi straight from the distillery. Um, I have a good buddy who travels back and forth to Japan and, and works out there. And he went to uh, the distillery on Hokkaido and he went to the distillery and, and grabbed these bottles for me. He, he muled them back. Uh, he got me one of, one of each, um, which was a pretty awesome, pretty amazing uh, little gift and surprise when, when, I, when he got back from Japan. So only available at the distillery. They're bottled at 55% uh, alcohol by volume. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty amazing. So Yuichi 100% in bourbon casks here. That looks amazing. I've tried the other two, um, the Salton's, what is that, Salton's Sweet or something, and then the... Uh, peaty and salty and sherry and sweet, yeah. They're absolutely amazing. Those are some like, like more impressive whiskeys I've had in a while. Um, do you mind just grabbing a cool bottle that I've never seen before. I'm sure. I'm sure it won't be too hard. Yeah, it, it won't be too hard. Uh, <laughs> so I 
Um, so they're all doing pretty good. They're all practicing social distancing. You know, we're still producing a little bit of whiskey, but most of the uh, major operations have kind of been put on hold. Um, but, but, you know, as you know, they're, they're pretty much on lockdown still in, uh, Scotland. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a quiet times for them. It's a, it's a good chance to make any modifications or, or repairs to the distillery if needed. Um, but yeah, overall pretty quiet right now in Scotland. But, uh, this is a bottle that I picked up, um, back. Oh, the Bona, that's an old bottle too. Yeah, back on my, my trip to uh, Scotland last year. So my very first supplier job, my very first job um, in in the Scotch whiskey industry was actually working for Buna Haven. Um, and that's actually how I met you guys at Seven Grand. And that was about 10 years ago now. Um, so this, when, I, when we went there, we had a, a really amazing tour at Buna Haven. And um, I picked up this 2003, that was the year I graduated high school. So that's when this distill was distilled, but it's also a Bunahaven that's been aged in Amontillado sherry casks. So I personally really love Amontillado. It's one of my favorite styles of sherry. So I picked up this guy and um, then we did a, a warehouse tour where we were able to go into the warehouse and taste out of barrels. Um, so I picked up this, this little guy um, and it's a 11 year old uh, Paolo Cortada uh, sherry cask oh, Bunahaven. Nice. Awesome. which is pretty magnificent as well yeah so some pretty pretty fun little little uh little whiskeys they've got going on right now buna haven has always been the distillery that has been the understar if you will it's, it's the distillery that never really had the love it deserves on isla if you've ever toured it you know that it looks like an old prison it's run down it's dirty <laughs> But they're producing some amazing whiskeys. When I went on this tour and this this visit, out of all the distilleries that I visited on that trip, we did nine distilleries on on that trip. I bought the most bottles at Bunahaven. So they're still making some pretty amazing whiskeys. And they're actually getting a $12 million renovation, which is pretty amazing. So so finally getting a little bit of love. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been one of my favorite uh, distilleries, I think. Probably because one of the first times I was drinking whiskey with you was because you were working with Bunahaven back then. Um, so you were speaking about like things slow down a little bit on Isla um, and Scotland over a whole. Um, is that going to, do you think it's going to impede on our production or do you think things are kind of still running in the same direction, just a little bit slower? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's, I think, I don't think it's going to have a huge dramatic impact. You know, most of the guys run a pretty tight ship. Um, as far as tourism, it's really slow, right? But as far as production and, and making whiskey, I think we're going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot. some of the distilleries, not our distilleries, are actually fully automated. And they run one-man crews or two-man crews. So, um, you know, they'll be able to make whiskey no problem. Um, yeah. As long as they're practicing social distancing and and really keeping everything clean and sanitary, which is a very important part when making whiskey and distilling. We have very, very strict uh, guidelines about our sanitation and safety. So, you know, business is, is normal. Yeah, um, and distilleries, distilleries tend to run under like a pretty strict regimen of like sanitation and like how many people are in the room and all that uh, to begin with. So. Uh, another question we had was uh, age statements versus no age statements. I personally yeah. think it's all nonsense because my one of my favorite whiskeys of all time, my definite favorite Glenmorangie is the Signet, which has no age statement on it. Um, yeah. Could you shed some light on this whole debacle? Yeah. So, um, personally, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of younger whiskeys. I love younger whiskeys. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career to taste a lot of different whiskeys, a lot of really, really old whiskeys, a lot of, you know, whiskeys from barrels. Um, I'm drinking an 11 year old Palo Cortada Bunahaven right now. That's what I just poured myself. And to me, you know, younger whiskeys can be really great and non-age statement whiskeys can be really great. 
as long as the distillery is producing a good quality spirit and putting it into good quality cask, a whiskey can show great characteristics and full body depth at a younger age. It's when you have whiskeys that are going into poor quality casks, maybe it's a poor distillate, and they're being aged, you know, for only a couple of years, that's when the flaws really come through, you know? So I, I'm personally not a huge fan of older, older whiskeys. For me, I like them under 18 years of age. I typically don't go to whiskeys that are over 18 years of old of age. Yes, I've had some amazing whiskeys that are older than 18 years, but most of the time, most of my experiences, they're too oaky and too woody. Um, so I personally prefer them at a younger age. But I would say there are a lot of great distilleries that are producing amazing quality whiskeys at younger ages. And if I step off to the side, you'll notice that I have quite a few Kill Holmans behind me, um, which is a very young distillery on Isla, right? They just celebrated 12 years. Um, most of their whiskeys in the past were at five, six years of age, and they're amazing whiskeys. They're really, really tasty. Um, you know, I remember the first time I had their three and a half year old port cask kill home, and it blew my mind. It blew my mind how good it was, and it's only three and a half years of age. And that's because they're using a really good quality spirit. They're using smaller spirit cuts. They're using really good quality casks, and they're doing things right. Um, so, yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah. You can have some non-age statement whiskeys that are not good as well, right? The, the hardest part for me is when I have a non-age statement whiskey that's maybe a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars, and it leaves me disappointed. That's when it's uh, that's that's when it's a, a bummer, you know. But yeah, I would agree. Well, if we don't have any other questions, uh, Travis, I would like to thank you for coming on the show tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, you're one of my favorite presenters when this bar does open in the future. Uh, we look forward to having you in again, and thanks for joining us tonight. And cheers to everybody out there joining us. Cheers. Cheers to you, Travis. Cheers. Thanks again. My pleasure. Happy when Friday. Things, when things yeah. do get back to normal, when things do get back to normal, I can tell you we'll do an amazing tasting. We'll bring some really killer bottles, and we'll have – an epic tasting down there in San Diego. I believe it. I, believe it. I look Cheers. forward to sharing some amazing whiskeys with everybody tuning in. And to you guys down in San Diego, be safe, be well. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers.